Welcome back. Continuing our discussion of attacking chess principles, I have a very nice miniature played by Martin Corden. Martin is a really cool guy. Uh, he's a former professor of physics at Florida State University, which is actually my alma mater. However, even cooler than that is that I had the privilege of meeting him. I bumped into him in South Florida when I used to work at the Minnesota Chess Center, where he would frequently make visits. Martin's a real nice guy. He's a little bit quiet. He's pretty humble, but his chess is still as exciting as ever. He still plays sharp, fun chess. Um, I have, I've been to his house. I've studied chess with him. He's a real nice guy. Okay. In the game, we had e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, the Italian game, and here, knight f6. The other move that you see in this position is bishop c5, and that's a slightly different flavor of Italian, but okay. Knight f6, and the most common move in this position these days is just d3, entering what's called the Gioco Pianissimo, and you can see this at every level of chess. You see this at scholastic level, you see this, you know, at your B class or A class, you see this among grandmasters, you even see this among, you know, Magnus and his peers. However, uh, or at the scholastic level, you could see like knight g5. If they know it, play might continue this way. If they don't know it, play might continue this way. With uh, this famous sacrifice, knight takes f7. After king takes f7, queen f3, king e6, this is called the fried liver attack. And if you're not familiar with this, you definitely should invest some time to at least read about it. This is a critical position that black has to know. If you, uh, if you are a 1e5 player. But okay, in the game, we didn't see any of that. We have the scotch gambit with d4. And the point of d4 is that we accelerate the development of our dark square bishop by gaining time against the e-pawn. We're threatening to take it, of course. And we also gain the entire center. So really, the only move for black is to take this pawn. And we won't develop the bishop right away. We can offer up a second pawn with castling and the best move in this position is knight takes e4 as was played in the game if black tries to just you know calmly hang on to his pawn black can be getting into trouble with this e5 entering the max lang attack and if black plays correctly he'll be okay but you know this is quite complicated black has to find best moves for like 20 moves in a row and um you know this deserves a video uh itself this line is very sharp and very difficult if you've never seen it before. Easiest is just knight takes e4. And in this position, we can pin the knight with rook e1, and our pieces are all going to jump to life pretty quickly in just a couple of moves. Our king is safer than black's king. It's true that we both have two minor pieces out, but that knight on e4 is pinned. We're threatening to just win the knight. The dark square bishop has a couple good squares, and we're even going to see the knight come to c3 with tactics in just a minute. d5 defends the knight, but now pause the video, see if you can find the tactical blow. Uh, congratulate yourself if you found bishop takes d5, and this move, I believe for white, is the only move that pursues equality. The point being that after queen takes d5, there is knight c3 exploiting both of these pins on the d and e files. And in this position, the queen typically goes to either a5 or h5, though I actually did see uh, queen to d8 in one game, which has slightly different theory than the other two moves. You actually will take with rook after queen to d8. But in Martin's game, it was queen a5. So now knight takes e4, bishop e6, getting ready to castle queenside. And I believe the most frequently played move here is bishop g5. However, in the game, it was bishop d2, tickling the queen first. And after queen f5, now bishop g5, preventing queenside castles, setting up some tricks. If you're responding to bishop g5 with f6, there can follow knight h4, and black is having a hard time in this position. Suggested by the engine is queen b5. However, here, when we played f6, uh, we actually undefended the bishop on e6. So play would follow knight takes f6 check g takes f6, bishop takes f6, hitting the rook, and after rook to g8, there would follow rook takes e6, regaining our piece with a better position. 
if you're moving to d5 in this position, then even better is just bishop takes and it's a free pawn. Because uh, if you're capturing back, then you just get forked. I leave it to you to lab out responses after f6, knight h4, uh, and other queen moves. But the idea is broadly that this bishop is now undefended, and we can exploit that. So in this position, seeing all this, Corden's opponent, who unfortunately we were not able to recall, I actually have asked him if he remembers the name of his opponent. He said it was a Dutch Grandmaster. That's about it. In the game, bishop b4, and the major principle that Martin is leveraging in this game is time. Uh, white is more developed than black. There's no time to be going like rookie two or even c3 might not be good. Like c3 and then d takes and then knight takes c3. No, you need to press forward here. No reverse gear. Knight takes d4, threatens to take the queen. After knight takes d4, queen takes d4, we have a threat against the g7 pawn. And if you're taking on e1, we actually are not going to take with the rook on e1. This would not be good enough. We actually will take on g7. Now, there's still no queenside castles because of our bishop. We're threatening the rook. And the only move that pursues equality for black is bishop takes f2, forcing us to waste time with our knight. However, after rook f8, I think white still has good chances. So after queen takes d4, in the game, it was a bishop back to f8, wasting time. A very sad move to have to make. Uh, the game is all but over now. Rook a to d1. And I put the question to you once again. Whose king is safer, white or black? Who has more pieces participating, white or black? You know, white is attacking with both rooks, the queen, the knight, and the bishop is preventing castling. Or, I mean, I mean, so are the rook and queen, but... The bishop is on g5 specifically to prevent castling. We're attacking with queen and rook. The rook on a8 hasn't moved. The rook on h8 hasn't moved. The, rook, the bishop on f8 moved out to b4 and then back to f8. The bishop on e6 can't meaningfully move, not without allowing devastation. The queen on f5 is the only piece contributing anything meaningful to black's position, uh, tying down our knight to the defense of the bishop. However, in this position, there is a threat of queen d8, rook takes d8, rook takes d8, checkmate a la Morphy. So you have to cut off the bishop. f6 was tried. However, this allows a forced checkmate in 5, a very beautiful mate. Pause the video, see if you can find it. Give yourself 10,000 points if you found queen to d7 check, sacrificing the queen. Because after bishop takes d7, there is knight d6 double check. And it's critical that this knight is controlling the f7 square. Because the only move for the king now is d8. We go knight f7, and this is sort of reminiscent of like the Halasar checkmate, if you're familiar with that. Uh, the rook is covering the open file, so after knight f7, the only move is king to c8. And the point of our queen sack is that now there is rook e8, sacking another rook. And then after bishop takes e8, there is rook d8, checkmate, rook supported by a knight. A beautiful checkmate and a beautiful game by Corden.